time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, a presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, author and analyst, and Mr. Hardy Burt, author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Warren G. Magnuson, Senator from the State of Washington. Senator Magnuson, our viewers, of course, uh, remember that you've been around Washington for about 18 years, a distinguished uh, Democratic Senator from the State of Washington. And tonight, sir, I'm sure that they'd like to hear a sort of report from the opposition from you. But first of all, sir, no uh, statesman can start saying anything tonight without commenting on the rather uh, interesting possibilities that might arise from Stalin's death. How do you feel, sir? Do you think that the chances for world peace may be increased or will be changed in any way by Stalin's uh, passing? Well, uh, uh, <coughs> Mr. Huey, I, I don't think uh, that there'll be any change in the situation. Uh, <coughs> I don't know that he's dead yet. Well, do you think it uh, can lead to a revolution? Uh, it yeah. could. It could. Uh, the history, Russian history is replete with uh, any time that some strong leader of the Russians, whether it be, be the Tsars or the, uh, uh, since the Bolshevik uh, Revolution. I suppose uh, you're hoping that history will repeat in this case. Uh, yeah, I, I hope it does repeat. But I do think that uh, Russia has uh, involved itself into a, a system in which individuals are not quite as important as they used to be, do you, and I don't look for too much change. Do you see any possible action indicated for our own government, or do you think we just have to sit tight <coughs> and see for a while? I don't know of any action we could, we could take uh, except to sit tight and see what happens. Well, I would think that probably, uh, for the time being, they would uh, have, uh, like the Romans had a triumvirate for a while, until someone, a man who was... Uh, uh, strong as Stalin would would come to the forefront. The really but serious question, do you think this conceivably could lead to war? It could. In what way? It could because uh, uh, someone in trying to achieve power uh, may put himself in a position where he has to do something affirmative to prove that, uh, that he's worthy of that leadership mm -hmm. and therefore he, he could uh, do some rash uh, thing that might other lead words, us to a war. In other words, anything can happen in Russia. Anything exactly. can happen now. Well, moving back to the domestic <laughs> and partisan political scene, sir, you, of course, are a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee yes. and a director concerned with money bills. And uh, as a Democratic spokesman, what do you consider to be uh, some of the possible mistakes that the new Republican administration is making? Well, uh, as a Democrat, I think there are several, Mr. Well, what's Mr. the first Hood? one that comes uh, to your mind? Uh, the first one that comes to mind, I think we have a very serious situation in, in, in what is commonly called the farm problem, uh, the question of a farm policy. Under Democratic administrations, we've had a definite farm policy of, of price supports, which we think have stabilized. Uh, farm economy. Well, what is a proper criticism of this administration? They're not <coughs> responsible for prices going no, down. No, they? they're not. No, I think that would have happened to any administration, but I think they are responsible for a vacillation of, of and the failure to announce a definite policy. It may be that uh, the abolition of price supports is desirable or flexible price supports. Uh, we have advocated a 90% parity. Well, do you personally favor a uh, the continued subsidy on a high level for the farmer? I, I favor, or most of us on the Democratic side have favored the 90% parity. Although uh, uh, Mr. Eisenhower at one time during the campaign said that the, he was going to give the farmers 100% parity without government control. Well, do you think Mr. Benson, his Secretary of Agriculture, says he's for flexible price support, and the whole thing has caused. A, a great concern uh, psychologically and other, otherwise among the farm uh, uh, people of the country and uh, that has resulted in the, uh, in the decline of, of uh, uh, commodity markets and the decline of farm prices and I think caused a great deal of confusion that was unnecessary. Well, isn't it true that uh, the two major farm organizations have come out very wholeheartedly in favor of Benson's policies, which is return to private enterprise and farming? Well, I, I think, Mr. Burt, some of the leaders have. Uh, there's been some confusion there, too. Uh, 
the national grains, for instance, are they, they, they have complete autonomy within the states. Some of the leaders have, and the National Farm Federation, uh, a Mr. Klein, who is constantly feuding about farm policies with, uh, I think, both with Mr. All of the, since the days of Mr. Wallace, uh, uh, has uh, taken, taken issue with uh, uh, not only Brannon, uh, but uh, I, I strongly suspect that there may be some uh, disagreement with even the well, president. But movement. their membership is not following them. Uh, the well, now, I don't know, but I do know that the overall farm situation has caused a great deal of concern. It's in the press all over in the Midwest. It's, uh, there's been several meetings. There's been uh, well, several... Uh, uh, well, move our on. mail is indicative yeah. of it. Every senator's mail. Uh, a concern about uh, what is the agricultural policy going to be under and the new administration. And your principal criticism is, is of their vacillation. Now, the second, moving on, sir, do you have any criticism of the way they are handling the Alaska and Hawaii statehood issue? Well, um, uh, Mr. Huey, of course, uh, the, that's a little personal with me. I, uh, I'm a strong advocate of uh, statehood for Alaska and Hawaii. I think they're both. Uh, ready to be admitted into the Union. Your state's particularly close to Alaska. Uh, most people on the Pacific coast uh, uh, feel that way. Hawaii is uh, definitely ready to be admitted, and I think Alaska is too. Are the Republicans playing any politics in <coughs> your view? Uh, I would think they would be playing a little politics with Alaska. Do you think the Democrats are going to play any politics with Hawaii? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, paradoxically, uh, there, there shouldn't be much partisan politics because strangely in this last election, uh, Alaska went Republican and Hawaii uh, went Democratic. Well, so far as Hawaii is concerned, yeah. isn't it true that the major opposition is going to come from the Democratic side? Well, uh, the southern uh, the southern bloc uh, in the Congress, which are mainly Democratic, uh, 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 favor uh, uh, favor, uh, of course, uh, uh, keeping the two two as territory. Is it your impression that Hawaii and Alaska definitely will be admitted for statehood? Oh, I think ultimately. I don't yeah. think even the Republican Party can stop Alaska. Well, now, coming from the state of Washington, where you have big public power development, sir, uh, you, of course, are tremendously interested in that issue. Now, uh, in, in a word, do you, are you uh, worried about the public power issue under an Eisenhower administration? Well, I, I've been quite concerned about that because uh, the statements during the campaign, uh, beginning at Boise, uh, where uh, Mr. Eisenhower met with all the uh, governors <laughs> and uh, with the appointment of the uh, former governor of Oregon, uh, Wallace McKay, as Secretary of the Interior, which mainly is in charge of the uh, Irrigation Reclamation and Power Program. Uh, I, I have, a, uh, I think, a real well, fear. Do you think there will be a great clamp down on public power uh, projects? I, I think there will. Be. Well, well, now, uh, what, what is your <coughs> position on public power? Do you well, favor I think we more to continue a federal development of public power. Uh, under, under the federal laws that we have uh, put in, have had an effect for many years, which give preference to public bodies, rural electrification, cooperatives, uh, cities and towns, and continue the federal program. I think under a private program or a state program, we can't reach the ultimate of, of our hydroelectric development. Senator, do you think they should uh, uh, federal spending should be cut? Well, uh, being a member of the Appropriations Committee, I, I would like to cut a lot of it. Do you think uh, we could continue public power projects and uh, farm subsidies? Oh, 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 yes. Uh, <laughs> public power projects are all reimbursable. We're seven years ahead of schedule. Are farm subsidies uh, reimbursable? No, they're not. But but yes. public power projects are. Com it's just a loan. Uh, we pay back to the government with interest. Do you see any any way, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, how the government can save money? I think we can uh, make <coughs> achieve some savings if if we want to, and I think we're going to uh, in the military. Returning to the public power issue, sir, our viewers have heard the Hell's Canyon issue uh, discussed on this program. Uh, where the government proposes to build a very large dam and where there's terrific private opposition to it. Now, what is your position on the Hell's Canyon project? Well, I strongly favor Hell's Canyon Dam. I, it's the greatest power site in the whole of the United States. It'll produce kilowatt, uh, kilowatts mm -hmm. cheaper than any other power site in the United States. And for our viewers in the Missouri Valley, sir, how do you stand on the various proposals for Missouri Valley Authority? Well, I, I'm to afraid develop? the proposal for a Missouri Valley Authority is going to have tough sledding. Uh, if uh, I uh, can interpret the statements and uh, uh, the policy that uh, seems to be uh, prevalent now in Washington. 
and I think it should be developed. Uh, no, no great uh, public uh, uh, project, uh, no great uh, development project uh, has ever been a white elephant. In this Do you country. think that the new Congress uh, will give the American people a tax break in reducing taxes? Well, uh, uh, the Republican Party is having some trouble with that right now. There's one segment that wants to reduce taxes and another segment that says they shouldn't reduce taxes. Although I recall uh, during October, during the balmy uh, weeks of September, that uh, they were promising a tax reduction to every citizen in the United States. Well, uh, sir. We're not going to have a tax reduction until uh, we can uh, find some, uh, I'm sure, uh, sensible people on both sides of the aisle, uh, until we can find some solution or at least some hope that we might achieve some peace in the world or a hope of peace so that we can reduce our military expenditure. That's the key to tax reduction. Well, sir, as a final question to all of our viewers who, who share your uh, liberal and democratic views, sir, do you have any, any final word as to uh, what the outlook is for lib the liberal philosophy in government during the next two years? Well, I, I think we liberals have to realign our forces. And, uh, and, uh, and I don't think we should criticize just for the sake of criticism. Uh, I think we should literally be uh, a loyal opposition. Well, thank you very much for being thank with you. us this evening, sir. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Warren G. Magnuson, Senator from the State of Washington. Have you noticed how much longer the days are getting? Soon it'll be spring and then Easter and then glorious days ahead. In countless homes, this is the season of planning great activities. Easter, graduation, an anniversary, or a June wedding. Every year, more and more people are giving Longines watches as gifts. For Easter, or for any important gift occasion, nothing can be worn with greater pride. And nothing that can be worn speaks more eloquently of your affection. When you give a Longines, it's much like giving a watch made to your individual order. For Longines watches are made in many hundreds of styles to assure just this exclusiveness. And when you give a Longines, you give the world's most honored watch. For among the finest watches in all the world, Longines alone has won 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 Gold Medal Awards, and so many honors for accuracy. And yet do you know that you may buy and own, or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as 7150. Longines, the world's most honored watch. The world's most honored gift for Easter, for graduation, a wedding, or an anniversary. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Daytime, see the new Freedom Rings on the CBS television network.